good to see everyone this morning. As you may have noticed, Andrea is on vacation. So uh, since, we, since we make our, our leaflets up for the season, do not expect me to break into song. This place is very slow music. Uh, I also couldn't get any of, any of the best members I asked to volunteer to solo or anything. So we are going to just do a spoken right to service this morning. For those of you following along at home, we're starting on page 355 in your Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say it together. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Glory to God, the heavenly King, Almighty God and Father. We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, who seek our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart, and united to one another with pure affection, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Found on page 268 in the three Bibles. The lesson from the book of Samuel, beginning at the first verse of the fifth chapter. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David in Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you that led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king in Hebron. And king David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. Moving on to verse 9. And David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. David built the city round about from the middle of inward. And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm point for this morning is Psalm 48, found in the insert. We'll say this psalm responsibly. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. In the city of our God is a holy hill. God is in her citadels. He is known to be her sure refuge. Behold, the kings of the earth assemble and march forward together. They looked and were astonished. They retreated and fled in terror. As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God has established her forever. Your praise, like your name, O God, reaches to the world's end. Your right hand is full of justice. Make the circuit of Zion, 
walk round about her, count the number of her towers. This God is our God forever and ever. He shall be our God forevermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as well as the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle lesson this morning is found on page 1010 in the Pew Bible. 1010. It's a lesson from the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, beginning at the second verse of the 12th chapter. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. For on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though I wish to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I shall be speaking the truth. I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insult, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For I am weak, but I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. You'll stand with me this morning for reading the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. He went away from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get all this? What is that wisdom given to him? What kind of works are wrought by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands upon a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called to him the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Where you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. And if any place will not receive you and they refuse to hear you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet for a testimony against them. So they went out and preached the mention repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick. And heal them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It's good to see so many of you this morning. I was not sure how many people would be here as everyone else told me they were at the shore or in the Poconos or somewhere else this morning. It's good to have you. When we saw David last week, he was in mourning. Over the next few chapters, we had a situation going on that today we call a dynastic struggle or a war of succession. Abner, who was one of Saul's cousins, and when David left him became Saul's head general, grabs Saul's youngest son and puts him on the throne. And for the next two years, we have a war that rages between primarily Judah and the rest of the tribes of Israel. It's got everything you'd want in an exciting story. Battles, betrayals, revenge, assassinations. And when it's all over with, David goes from reigning over Judah. And this morning we find that all the tribes of Israel came to him in Hebron and said, 
we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on the military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. One of the first acts we see David do as king is to change his capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. In verses 6 through 8 that we didn't read this morning, we read of David leading his men to conquer the city that will become known as the city of David, the Holy Zion. When he goes to confront them, they taunt him and make fun of him as they sit behind their walls, thinking that is going to protect them and make them invulnerable. But David sneaks a force in through the water tunnels that supply the city and conquers it from within. Jerusalem becomes the focus of God's people from then on. As our psalm says this morning, beautiful and lofty, the joy of all the earth is the hill of Zion, the very center of the world, and the city of the great king. In many ways, this day marks the high point of David's kingdom. He'll never be more popular than he is right now. His great victory over Goliath is in the past. Now, he has to get in front of the people there to be their shepherd and be their ruler. It's interesting, though, that people do say, you will be the shepherd of my people. People say God brought them. God brought David there to be the shepherd of the nation. But it's a designation we don't really see the kings of Israel and Judah live into. A shepherd has to be among the sheep to take care of them. It's not a job you can do from a palace or from an ivory tower somewhere. I've heard the bishop say over the years, a shepherd has to smell like the sheep. And David and his descendants had a hard time living into that reality. At some point, the trappings of power and the call of luxury are seductive. In our gospel this morning, Jesus leaves Jairus' house and returns home. He preaches a powerful message in his hometown. And what was their response? It says they were astounded and said, Where did he get this? Where is this wisdom that's been given to him? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Aren't his brothers James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. This leads Jesus to give one of his more famous sayings. One you read in history books and business courses that have nothing to do with Christianity. Prophets are not without honor, except in their own hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And the results are that you can do no great deeds of power there, except to lay hands on a few sick and cure them. Only a few miraculous things happened among his own friends and his own neighbors, where you think he would be more successful. And it says he was amazed at their unbelief. But from there he went out to teach and began to send the apostles out with the Holy Spirit's power to preach and share God's love. And now we see miracles take place. But look this morning on how he told the disciples to go out. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. To wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said, wherever you enter into a house, stay there until you leave the place. Halfway through their journey, they're staying in a city and they don't get to upgrade rooms to a better residence. His disciples had power. The Gospels say spiritual power worked miracles. And Jesus sent them out with minimal possessions and told them to stay and look amongst the people. To smell like the sheep. Last week, we saw Paul asking the Corinthians to help the church in Jerusalem in their time of need. And over the next few chapters, we see Paul first commend Titus, who he sent the letter with, to the Corinthians. Now, we know that Titus had already been in Corinth before, and he seems to be respected by them. Titus was carrying the letter from Paul to the Corinthians, and, he, and Paul also tells them that he's going to be carrying whatever gifts they send to Jerusalem, straight to Jerusalem with the other offerings. And then Paul starts a defense of himself and his ministry. And in the midst of this defense, we have Paul saying this morning, I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Yes, we're pretty sure it was Paul 
talking about the experience that Paul had. The idea of the third heaven in Judaism at this time comes from several non-biblical sources, and this morning I don't want to get bogged down to long discussion of first century Jewish cosmology. Suffice it to say that the important thing to know about the third heaven here is that in the first century they believed the third heaven was where the throne of God was, where God resided with the angels, with the cherubim and seraphim, like we read about a few weeks ago in the book of Daniel. So in defense of his ministry, Paul is saying, you know, like the prophets of old, God pulled me directly into his throne room. My kids would call that a little bit of a flex, a little bit of boasting this morning, in defense of his calling. And in the midst of learning revelations, he tells the Corinthians he's, that are too great, he's not allowed to share. To keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. A lot of time in the ensuing centuries have focused themselves on what this thorn in the flesh was and not the other thing, other things Paul's talking about here. Tertullian thought it might be, Paul might be afflicted with headaches. Maybe he got what we would today would call migraines. Based on Galatians 6.11, others suggested that the affliction Paul may have had may have had to do with his eyesight. Maybe like Jonathan Edwards to read, Paul had to do this number. Some people think that the phrase, a messenger of Satan to torment me, is a callback to the way the book of Job talks about Job's oppressors. So maybe it's a demon, maybe it's someone physical. It doesn't matter. When Paul prayed, have it taken away from him. God didn't take it away. But instead, God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Back in chapter 10, his opponents charged that his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is much despised. Paul responded to them by saying, It isn't he who commends himself who is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Paul is saying here that the Lord's approval is what makes Paul strong, strong even in the midst of his own weaknesses. And that approval can be proved true by what God is doing in Paul. This God is our God forever and ever. He shall be our guide forevermore. Paul had founded the church in Corinth less than a decade before writing this letter. And in that decade, we find new teachers coming in after Paul left. And some of them preached a message that the Corinthians felt was stronger, they felt was more powerful, and likely promised them more worldly success. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul alludes to the choice he has. He can reassert his own strength. He can reassert himself as a confident leader, or he can continue to preach the gospel of Christ crucified, the stumbling block to the Jews. And foolishness to the Gentiles. And Paul reaffirms here that therefore I am content with weaknesses, insult, hardship, persecution, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, I am strong. And that is the choice we have to preach Christ and share his love to the world, or to preach a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. That maybe, just maybe, bring us a better position in this world. I pray this morning we will be able to affirm the words of our baptismal covenant. When asked, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God and Christ? When asked, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? We will be able to affirm now, as we did then, I will, with God's help. Amen. You'll stand with me.
Let's affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God of the Father, God from God, the light from light, true God from true God, the God of not made, but one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation.
mercy on you, give you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. You'll stand with me this morning. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourselves. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. 
Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and that at the last days bring us with you and all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us seek peace. Hallelujah. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. The gifts of God to the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on you in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us with spiritual food for the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us share in this holy mystery that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to the work you have given us today to love and to serve you as a faithful witness. Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds with the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. A couple of quick announcements this morning. The church offices will be closed tomorrow in honor of Independence Day. We'll be back in on Tuesday, and there will be Bible study in Compline on Wednesday. Next Sunday, we will be at Old Union for the 9:30 service. We'd love to have you all there. Bob Golden has a surprise he has prepared for us. If you drive by this week, you can spoil yourselves. Uh, otherwise, I'll leave it until then as he's requested. Uh, the week, two weeks after that, on the 25th, I will be gone on vacation. The Reverend Linda Kerr will be here, and we'll just have one service at 9.30, Eucharist, that morning. Um, have a happy 4th of July, everyone. Stay safe. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, or barring dad, don't do anything my wife wouldn't do, which when it comes to fireworks is probably a better mantra to live by. And it's good to have you this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be God. Hallelujah.